Hi everyone, and today I'm excited to present to you TaskGen, a new task-based agentic framework that builds on strict JSON. So there's a lot of key terms here, but the key idea is traditional agentic frameworks, like for example, AutoGen, they like to talk in conversational text. So the agent will talk to one another and then each of them will say hello and thank you and so on. And like they will call upon all the agents one by one or like select an agent in the conversation setting. And as you know, in group settings, not everyone is needed. So this tends to bring the conversation to be very long and it's very verbose and you know it takes quite long to solve a task. Hence, task gen was created, okay? Because we don't want that. If you just purely want to do a task, like for example, if you are using like your mobile phone and you want to um, go to a certain web page, you don't want the agents to talk to one another for five minutes and then finally decide to go to your web page. You just want to invoke maybe a, a function or two to just go to the web page, extract the data and so on. So we want to go directly to solve the task with minimal chatter. And task gen was designed with that in mind. So just some acknowledgements. Uh, strict JSON, I've been spending about one year trying to build it. It's a way to pass JSON output of large language model to preserve the keys as well as the types. And TaskGen was created as part of Symbian AI because we are actually trying to do agentic framework and use that for our products. So I'll just give maybe a short time for our boss, um, Ambuch, from Symbian to just introduce what Symbian is about first. Yeah, thanks, John. Um... So at Symbian, we are automating security with AI. Uh, security, that is cyber security, has long been about uh, protecting our data and things uh, and finances. But now I'm sure you have seen news that some ransomware gang held a hospital hostage and they were unable to provide their service. So I think cyber security is now more important. Um, you know, it's about not just keeping our dignity, but you know, just being alive. It's as fundamental as that. And, you know, uh, bad guys are using all kinds of weapons at their disposal, including AI. Uh, so defenders, good guys also need it. And so this is where Symbian comes in. We are going to solve security with help of AI. And uh, in that journey, TaskGen, TaskGen is an important component um, because it allows us to build an agentic framework um, using your your uh, choice of uh, um, LLM. And when we started to use it, uh, we found it so powerful uh, that at one point we thought, uh, maybe we should keep it to ourselves. But then we said that, no, more we share with a uh, larger community, um, more people will see benefit from it, um, as well as they will also contribute fixes and new features to it. So we'll also win, uh, we'll also benefit. So it's a win-win relationship, and I'm so very happy that John is leading it. So I ask for everyone's help on that. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks, Abuj. So I'm actually quite glad that Abuj allowed me to open source most of the work uh, that I did with Symbian, because uh, I'm actually a very strong open source person. Like I, I believe that progress can be made by sharing and improving upon each other's framework. Like I'm very happy that like Microsoft shared quite a few stuff, like AutoGen. Um, there's also different companies that share open source versions. So this helped the community to progress. So yeah, I just also want to encourage more open source efforts here uh, because large language models is quite an unexplored territory, especially agents and current leading frameworks. Uh, I don't find them very satisfactory. So I hope to make TaskGen a more satisfactory approach to solve the problems. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on. Okay, don't want to harp too much about TaskGen, but what are the key features of TaskGen? So, it is very similar to like, um, if you think about like auto GPT and stuff like that, you you split into subtasks to solve each problem in bite size, but it is very different from auto GPT because it is not as long winded. I'll, I'll explain why it's different. Uh, the main thing is solved by subtasks. Each subtask links to a function, either a large language model function or an external function. And then we also have agents that can call other agents as functions. So it's, it's like inception, agents within agents. Quite, quite cool idea. Right. Uh, we have ways to share knowledge between agents using shared variables. So all the functions would also be able to obtain the shared variables so you can keep your state between functions. All right, then uh, lastly, we have some form of memory. And I think this memory is going to be very important because with memory, you can modify the behavior of your agent by at runtime matching to the task description that you have 
you can retrieve relevant stuff from your memory to condition what the agent generates. So this could be like you can retrieve from knowledge graphs, you can retrieve from um, different data sources to tell the agent how to do better contextual knowledge and so on. And by default, TaskGen already provides a retrieval augmented generation, a rack over your function space. So if let's say you have like 20 functions, we will automatically by cosine similarity choose for you maybe the top K, uh, default is five, top K functions for the agent to use. Okay, this is very important because like in my work with agents, like in the abstraction and reasoning corpus um, to like make an agent do an IQ test, like picture input to picture output. I realized that if you give the agent too many functions, you get nonsense outputs quite often. So agents need to be constrained quite well in the prompt. You cannot give too much irrelevant information. And so rec could play a role here. Okay, so these are some features. Um, yeah, before I move on, can I just check anyone wants to like ask any burning questions about task gen? If not, the flow of today's conversation, I will firstly step a brief introduction into what is trick JSON. Then I'll move on to task gen and the design philosophy. Uh, any quick questions first before I, I move on? Okay, let's go. So what is strict JSON? Okay, so strict JSON, I'm very proud to introduce it as well because this is my solution to making sure that the JSON output can be passed. Okay, so um, I know that if you all remember like about one year ago when OpenAI first released GPT, chat GPT, the JSON, if you ask it to output in a JSON string, Sometimes the string will be missing a quotation mark. Sometimes will be missing a close bracket. And if you ask it to generate code, it's very likely the code won't compile. All right. So this strict JSON tries to solve all of, all of that through some clever prompt engineering tricks. So there's no fine tuning at all. It's just prompt engineering. And I believe this also applies to other open source models. I tested a few like Lama 2, it should work. Mistro I haven't tested yet, but if Lama 2 works, Mistro should work as well. So this is a plug and play for like any model. Okay, uh, if there's any problem, let me know. Maybe we can prompt engineer that for your model. But I don't want to just rely on OpenAI JSON mode because that's only for one specific model or a few specific models. So this kind of works for any out of the box large language model that can output JSON. So what does this do? Okay, why do we use JSON output? So if you take a look here, this is chat dev. Hands up, who has heard of chat dev before? The one that can create computer programs like simulate a software company who here has heard of chat dev anyone okay quite a few all right so if you all remember chat dev it's like it goes through like two people will chat at one time and then the result will go to a next set of two people and next set of two people and so on so it's um, something to do with like a process flow which if each step of the process flow being a conversation great idea the process flow but the conversation is not that great an idea okay why you take a look at this thing here so in order to just choose what programming language to design a game, look at what happened. The CEO and the CTO will talk to one another. I mean, it sounds very cool, right? Oh, great. We should use Pygame. Yes, we should use Python. Let's get started. Can you all see the problem here? This is just choosing the computer language, right? I mean, if you are if you are trying to do a Pygame, right, it's quite obvious that like what, what you want is in Python. Or like if you want to do a game, you could just ask like, what language should I choose? All right. And that is something that you don't need a conversation for. All right, so most of the agentic frameworks are like that. So um, this particular one, this two, two person one is called Camel. Right? It's, it's basically the idea of using two people to discuss and come up with an idea. However, in most cases, actually you don't need the discussion. You just need the large language model to output something. And that you can just use JSON. All right. So you look over here on the right. I just put, I want to create a Gomoku game output following JSON without explanation, then you have the key programming language and you have the other key modules. So you can see in the output, your programming language is Python and modules is Pygame. So just a simple prompt like this, you can do it in very few tokens and the answer is the same. And one thing I would like to highlight is that JSON serves as a natural way to do chain of thought. Okay, you all know what is chain of thought. It means that you ask the model to think step by step so this is even more powerful than the traditional let's think step by step. This allows the model to come up with the first guiding question, which is here, programming language. And then the second guiding question here, which is modules. So each of these JSON keys allows the model to slowly step through from broad to specific and the generation will be better and better 
and you can even describe what you want to do here. So I find JSON, the, the way like the key and the value, the, the way it's structured, serves as a very good way to ground the language model to generate something great. And, and this idea of using JSON is not new. A lot of people have done it. It's just that the JSON that's generated sometimes cannot be passed. All right, so that's a problem. And that's what strict JSON is meant to solve. All right, so I, I really like this uh, JSON output formatting. I think this should be like the way to go if we want to be concise and be structured about the generation. So function calling, okay, this is another painful part, okay. Um, I don't like function calling. I don't like the open AI function calling. And uh, let me explain to you why. Take a look at the diagram on the left, which is from the official open AI function calling website. So in order to call a function to get the current weather, all right, we need to say type is function and the function itself has the name, description, parameters, type, properties. Okay, this is the function name. This one, I mean the parameter name, we need that. All right, this format is also another parameter name. So you can see that out of this whole thing, a lot is redundant. Okay, can, can you see that? You actually don't need so much text, all right? But the JSON schema for the function itself is so verbose and lengthy. All this count into your tokens for the large language model. If you look at straight JSON, all you need to do is like, oh, fit user intent with the function call. The prompt could be like, get weather in San France. And then you have the key, which is like the input parameter. And then like city and state. You can specify your, your type here as well. We will do type checking, type string. Here, I put temperature, or you can actually change this to format as well. It will work as well. Infer from location, and then you can put like the enum over here. So you can see whatever this uh, type over here, we can also do the type checking as well in strict JSON. So you can get the answer in a much more concise way. So just defining and getting the function params, I already use fewer tokens than the open AI function calling. Just the so they just define the function. We don't even have the call to get the parameters yet. Already you can see that this is very long. Anyone here can tell me why, why having such a long amount of tokens or large amount of tokens is bad? Anyone? Like just to define like one function. A any suggestions? Why why our, uh, our context length is very limited? Correct. Thanks for the answer, Brian. So this is as what this slide shows, all right? Tokens, okay, not just cost, all right? Cost is one thing, but more importantly, long context for large language models is not soft, all right? Most people think that, oh, maybe Gemini 1.5 can go up to 1 billion tokens, but how many of it can you actually attend to? Like, um, you might miss out some stuff and so on. The way positional embeddings work in Transformers is that, as you scale up more and more positions, the embeddings become less and less well-defined, right? Because it's using a sine and cosine curve. Yeah. So this is something that is even worse for rotary position embeddings because they rotate the embedding directly with the angle. So like, let's say this is the embedded, embedding, rotary position embeddings based on the position, it will rotate the angle of the embedding itself, which actually changes the semantic meaning. So rotary position embeddings in Lama 2, you can see in this paper, effective long context scaling of foundation models. After this amount of task length, like about 2,000 to 3,000 tokens, the root score, which is like how similar the score, how similar the output answer is to the model answer, uh, it drops drastically after like 2,000, 3,000 tokens. So if you are going to spend like 200 tokens on one function itself, you know, maybe you put 10 functions, you will meet your 2,000 context length rate. Whereas if you use strict JSON, maybe you only spend like maybe 50 tokens on your function, you can fit in 50 functions. Okay, so this is quite significant. And I suspect a lot of the reasons why the function calling agents fail right now is because of, of this schema here. It's just too verbose, too lengthy. And you know, it doesn't really match well with the way attention works as well. Like if you look over here, in order to attend to, oh, what, what I need to, what I need to output, I need to find out this particular thing itself, I need to find out this particular itself, then there's a lot of things here I need to ignore. You know, if you just go by here, like immediately I already know what to focus on, like location and like that. So by putting it in one line like that actually helps the large language model pay attention to the output format better. So I really hope OpenAI will change their function calling because I, I don't really like it. Yeah, so this 
is the reason why strict JSON was created, all right? Um, in order to reduce number of tokens and to make it more compact. Uh, questions for this so far? Okay, let's move on. So um, just maybe five to 10 minutes just to briefly describe strict JSON because I want to focus more on task gen. So what can strict JSON do? Okay, it's basically like a simplified Pythantic. Okay, it allows you to, to force certain input uh, output types like integer, float, string, dictionary, list, array, um, dict, like that you can specify your dictionary keys. So for example, if you're dict, you want to have name and property, you can put like that in your type that we will ensure that the key name and property will be there in the dictionary. The okay, list, all right, you can put like nested lists over here. So if you want to enclose your, your dict in a list, like a list of dictionaries, you can just do like that. And all these will be handled back end by strict JSON, all right? Array, array is the same as list. Okay, later I'll explain to you why array was there, all right? Enum is to enumerate over a list of choices. And Boolean is true and false. Okay, so, this, I think, basically covers most of the common output types that you expect. So strict JSON, in my opinion, is quite versatile. So for example, if you look over here, you just need to put in like UR classifier, and then this is your user input. Like it is a beautiful and sunny day. And then your output format here, you can specify what you want to get out of it. So you can specify, oh, I want to get a type of sentiment. It must be an enum of positive, negative, of other. All right, and you can see the answer, positive. They will just choose the best one. Okay, why I put other here is because sometimes if it cannot fit in the categories above, if you don't put other, it will not have a valid output category and it might fail. Okay, so this one, um, while I would like to say it forces the output to be a certain format, this is still a, a large language model after all. So the semantics wise, it should match in order for the output to be to be well outputted. All right, adjectives, you can see that we have a list of string. So it will force into a list like that. So very useful if you want definitely a list output. A okay, number of words, integer so you can see it's here integer and whether it's in english or not boolean it will force into true or false so the good thing about strict json is that whatever output you get from here it will be a python dictionary okay it's it's by right a json string but it's mapped into a python dictionary for you so you can just do like for example if you want the sentiment you can just type rest sentiment and so on yeah then you can straight away get the sentiment out which is positive okay uh julio you raise your hand yeah anything uh, yeah, just how important are the key names for these for this dictionary, the output format? Like you have capital I in with a space English, and a lot of times in Python, you would just write that as lowercase with an underscore. Does the LLM use that information, or does it matter? Okay. Um, does that so, make sense? Uh, in general, it shouldn't matter. But as a okay. convention for strict JSON, I usually like to capitalize my keys because um, I find that if I capitalize my keys, and then if I describe my keys in the system prompt, I, I mean, it's, it's to help the LM match. Because like sometimes if you want to say the sentiment should be something, you, you know, you want to differentiate between your sentiment as a key and a sentiment as a word. So I usually just put capital for the key so that when I talk about it in the system prompt, um, it will be distinguished from the, the normal word sentiment. Yeah, but uh, in general, okay. if you put small letters, it should, it should still work. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you can try it and let me know, yeah. So um, this one, yeah. I'd like to point out a certain prompt engineering trick as well. So array, okay. <laughs> so this is what I learned after a few weeks of testing it. Um, when I put type as list, uh, it doesn't generate the list out all the time, okay? There needs to be error correction and so on. But if I put my type as an array, all right? Um, this actually makes the output like 99% become a list, okay, like this. Okay, and this, you have to think about how this is, uh, why this is done. Okay, because in the JSON itself, the JSON type is called an array. And uh, OpenAI trains a lot on JSON. So essentially, I'm just like, I'm, I'm bootstrapping on whatever OpenAI has trained for their JSON mode. And if I use the same keywords here in strict JSON, I'll leverage on whatever training that they did to improve strict JSON. So while I don't have access to the OpenAI model, but I roughly know how they train it, I try to match the words they use for their training, which is basically the JSON. So you can see that if we do that, if we just put array, the performance is much better. So I put this array here, but don't worry. If you use the type as list, uh, backend strict JSON will convert to you to array as well. So you'll benefit from the word array. Okay, so this is from engineering here. 
Okay, it doesn't work the same as classical programming. Certain words mean certain things because in the training set it appears. And so we try to best match the training set to improve the performance. Okay, any other questions for straight JSON? All good. Hey John, yeah, I, I do have a quick question. So so what about a multi-model? Like uh an image or like you know audio, would would that be part of the type or I'm thinking the wrong way? Okay, so straight JSON is limited to text only right now. So it's not a multi-modal model. So if you want to output like image, I think the best way to do it is a specialized uh, image output model, uh, which you can assign to a function. And basically the agentic framework can call that function for that multi-modal output. So you don't use straight JSON to output stuff. So uh, whatever straight JSON is doing is just text output. Okay, got it. So um, just to, uh, who's oh, that? I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Uh, it's Sebastian. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah. Hi. Um, just on a little bit of kind of what's going on in the back scenes. Are you kind of tapping into the model directly in the way that uh, guidance or LMQL are, or is this uh, just prompt engineering on top and, and kind of error correction? Yeah. So I mean, good question. So I'm I will just go straight into how it works. So back end, what we'll do is we'll add hex 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 or some delimiters to the keys. And then we'll add angle brackets to the to the descriptions. And then I'll just add one other thing, update text and close in this, be concise, and I'll put the JSON string without any explanation. So these are the extra things that will be given in the prompt uh, when you call straight JSON. So whatever you see here is whatever is input to GPT. And the output for GPT will be of this form with all the hexes and so on. And what I'll do is I'll use regex to extract the keys and the values because I already have this delimiters. I know what to extract. So even if over here missing a quotation mark and so on, it doesn't matter because I'm splitting on the delimiter here. So it works for a lot of cases that got me a lot of headache back then. So, yeah, <laughs> saves a lot of headache for sure. Appreciate yeah. it. So just, just by a smart way of putting the delimiters, the JSON will always be passed because GPT can remember this quite well. I mean, this is this is something that they expect as well as a key. Like, so I'm I'm using I'm exploiting this fact. So I tried different ways and this worked the best, right? So in order to do nested loops, uh, nested lists, nested dictionaries, I simply just add more like this. So this is the second layer. So that we, we extract the time we extract recursively, we extract the first layer first, then we extract the second layer. And all these are handled back end by straight JSON. Um, nice. type, check, type checks, how do we do type checks? All rule base. So we will take the output here and we will compare whether it's a list, whether it's a string and so on. If it's not a list or string, we will do an error message to the LM to say, hey, um, it's not a list, try this, or like try to split it into a list. So there will be some error message that is very helpful and guided so that the language model can push towards the output as a list. So it's very different from Pydantic. Pydantic just raises an error. Here, I not just have an error, I also will guide the model to output the correct thing. So it is, I'll say it's much better than Pydantic. <laughs> I, I don't like Pydantic. So um, yeah, I built this so that I don't have to use Pydantic. Yeah. So uh, that, that, that clarify your, your question, Sebastian? Absolutely, no, uh, perfect, thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Uh, this is meant to be open source, nothing to hide here. Uh, you can go to the strict JSON repo or the task gen repo, look at the base.py, all the all the ways to process it using regex and rule based stuff are all there. So you can you can take a look. Oh, okay. So um just to highlight other stuff, you can also generate code. So like stuff like this, like C code or this. Um, if you use traditional um json.loads it will likely fail. <laughs> I've tried it before, it fails. All right, so it works for straight JSON. So if you want to output code and stuff, you can use JSON to output, like task, uh, sorry, autogen outputs code. So autogen um, might be able to use straight JSON as well to do the code output, okay? It can also do nested structures like that. You can see it's so complicated, right? Like um, there's a few like um, brackets and so on with enum, like name and description in a list with a dictionary name and description. It comes out like that. Okay, um, just some caveat. Um, it doesn't work for all the kind of nested structures. It needs to be, in some sense, like whatever you describe here in the output needs to match the key name. Okay, so it's very sensitive. Okay, it's very sensitive to output key names. Okay, because sometimes you, you write a random name, you might interpret the name as a meaning. 
this is the issue with large language model uh, prompting. Like the key itself means something. You cannot just put garbage meanings for the keys. So it's best to match whatever key you want here with the description of what you want for the output here. So that in terms of semantic coherence, it's uh, very coherent to the language model. The chance of you getting the right output is very high. If you mismatch the key to the description, it might give you like there will be a mismatch and you might interpret it wrongly. Okay, so this one, uh, leave it to you to explore. But so far, um, using straight JSON has guaranteed the JSON fight uh, to, a, to a large extent. And this is the foundation for the agent's outputs in TaskGen. Questions for this? Okay, cool. Let's move on to the key thing for today. So I don't want to touch on straight JSON too much. Let's move to the main highlight of today, which is TaskGen. So what is TaskGen? TaskGen is using strict JSONs for the output processing for the agents so that we get very concise output. So no longer will you have like very verbose outputs and stuff like that. You can just take the JSON output and, and then can move on from, from, task to, uh, from subtask to subtask. So let me share with you one of the gripes I have, a few of the gripes I have with existing agentic frameworks. So uh, first up, we have this very, very new and promising architecture, baby AGI or auto GPT. Um, basically, to, to make things simple, um, given a task, they split the task up okay, into, into, into certain tasks. All right. After that, what we'll do is we'll go and prioritize the, the task to choose one task that we want to do, and then we execute it. Yeah, so the thing is, it sounds great um, in... Basically, it sounds great in, in theory. Like, oh, yes, we keep creating a task list. We prioritize what task we want to do. We execute the task, and then we keep visiting back the task list, and then we do what to the end of the task list. Um, but if you have ever used a baby AGI or auto GPT before, you find that um, like even after thirty, after ten to twenty iterations, there's still lists, there's still tasks to do. All right, it's never ending. All right. Um, one of the reasons is because when they come out with the task list, they just ask GPT to generate what are the subtasks needed to 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 fulfill it. And sometimes it might go into a cyclic loop. Like, for example, in order to go to the web page, I need to click on this button. Okay. Then GPT might say, in order to click on this button, I need to go to this web page. So you keep going in the cycle. So there's, there's some issue with just letting GPT free flow generate the, the subtasks. Okay. You might never end. Okay. And also the subtasks generated, you might not be able to do it. Like sometimes people put the objective, get me a million dollars, right? I mean, when AutoGPT first came out, that was one of the, the more popular Telegram posts. And uh, I think that was uh, X, yeah. So what happened is that if you ask this kind of very vague task, uh, in the end, they come out with like a thousand ways to, to do it. Like you essentially will never end because you have too many things that you can do. So this is one of the problems that uh, this baby AGI or AutoGPT has. All right, um, this is improved significantly in AutoGen. Autogen, uh, we don't exactly have this because Autogen is more of a conversational framework, okay? But if you look at Autogen, I did a session on it before, you'll find that uh, most of the time they will say hello to each other very nicely, hi, um, and then at the end they'll say thank you, thank you, or they will say sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so this is a, 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 a feature or uh, basically what ChatGPT is trained on is to be polite and like respond in a friendly way. Like, Reinforcement learning with human feedback has caused it to do that. You, you, you can see this is what happens. Like, you're welcome, thank you, and so on. That, that's a total waste of tokens, right? I mean, this doesn't help with your task at, at, at all. And then in the middle, you know, um, they also will talk about a lot of other non-task related stuff. Like, they want to be courteous to one another and so on. So, Autogen, the idea is nice. The execution-wise, is uh, leaves more to be desired. All right, and also in the paper itself, they mentioned that they tried to have a task selector to select the agents to do the next task. It didn't work too well. Okay, I have my own reasons for that. I think it's because there's too much in the context when they use it to select. Okay, we need a more concise representation of what the task still left to do, and we choose the right agent for it. Okay, so another thing they realized is that if they let the agents like freely talk about the task, a lot of times, some agents will, will do tasks that are not meant for them. Like, for example, the coder agent is meant to code, right? 
in this example, like sometimes even the like even the critic or, or the engineer will be the one coding, but it should be the coder coding. So the different agents might just step in to do tasks that are not supposed to be what they are meant to do. And so this might lead to confusing output or it might even lead to incorrect output. So this is something that I think needs to be solved. Okay, because we don't want to have everyone doing everything. We want to have like targeted um, agents to do targeted things. So in task gen, the way it's conceptualized is slightly different. It's meant to solve these two problems. So before I move into what task gen does, I would like to stick into a conceptual walkthrough of how task gen was created. Okay, and this one over here, you can see that we have a key question here, which is how does an agent know what it needs to do given a task? So you see, this is your task over here. And in your task over here, what we will have is that in order to, to fulfill this task, we can do many things. And what are the many things we can do? We can actually do, like for example, if your task is, say, go to a certain web page and buy an item, okay? Maybe we want to buy something like, maybe buy Taylor Swift concert. Okay, so let's say that's your, your task. There are many, many things that you can do in order to, to fulfill that task, all right? So this means that like, okay, first thing, maybe I can, you know, search uh, which concert, okay? Then maybe another thing is like, I can, I can search which web page. To buy okay then i can also do like um check for uh which bank account to use and so on so, so there's many many things that you can do and like you know you might even need to like search who is taylor swift you know because the model may not know all this so there are many things that you can do in order to solve this kind of task right and if you let gpt or let the large language model freely decide what it wants to do gone case, okay, you'll be something like auto GPT, all right, you will never end, all right, the, the model will keep coming out with subtasks and subtasks and subtasks and subtasks, and by the time you decide that, you know, maybe it's time to execute my main task, it's so deep into the subtasks <laughs> that it will never complete the task, all right, so we don't want that to happen, okay, we want the flow of tasks to be very, very specific, very, very targeted, and not just any random kind of action like that. How, how can we do this? So this is where the functions come into play. So earlier on, when we look at Autogen, uh, you realize that they actually use more of a conversational style and the functions part is like secondary. Here in the task gen framework, the functions are primary. Okay, so what does the agent do is determined by what functions you give it. Okay, let me just highlight this part here, okay? what the agent does is determined by what functions you give it. So it's very important because you constrain the output of the large language model and constraining outputs of large language models help to generate more accurate and more reliable results. So let's take, for example, the same task as just now, like go to web page and buy Taylor Swift concert tickets. Okay, let's say this is your task, all right? So if let's say I interface it with like, I don't know, is it Ticketmaster? Or, yeah, so basically like, uh, okay, web search agent, web search tool. Okay, then maybe we interface it with like the, the money or, or, or bank app to uh, basically interact with your bank and so on. So if you already do all this instantly, you don't have to search everything, right? You can just basically use the web search tool find out yeah so immediately with all these tools you can basically map it into certain things that are related like how to do online purchases with a corresponding website so you can see that if you want to do stuff like that you kind of need to know what tools you have. And based on what tools you have, you immediately constrain your thinking. Okay, so 
This is very important because you don't want the model to do everything. You just want the model to do what it's good at. And what it's good at is defined as what functions you interface with it. So I find that all the earlier models of agentic framework are too reliant on conversational text. We need to move away from that. We move into tool-based or function-based conditioning. We'll do much better. Okay, so let's give you a real life example. Uh, let's talk about humans like us. All right, we can walk, we can run. Can we fly? We can't fly, right? So when you think of going from point A to point B, in your mind, do you even think of like, I will fly from point A to point B like Superman, okay? Probably not, right? You eliminate that thought, all right? Do you think of uh, digging underground to go there? Not really, right? Because most of the time we don't do that, okay? We normally walk on the floor, all right? So this constrains our action space significantly because we can only walk, all right? Maybe we can take a car, a plane. I mean, that, that that's a different story, but just purely based on our biology, we can only do certain things. And these certain things constrain the way we do things. Like, for example, now I'm talking to you right now. Okay, this is my way of conveying information to you. If I had been infused with a skill set called telepathy, I can infuse my brain waves directly into you. We won't be talking anymore. All right, we'll just be using our brain waves to, to communicate with one another. Okay, but the fact is, because we don't have that skill set infused in us, we don't think in that way. Right? Who here thinks of using telepathy to, to talk to one another? Anyone? Naturally, like the first instinct, you want to communicate with someone, you use brain waves and try to communicate. Anyone thinks in that way? No, right? Most of the time, you want to verbally express yourself or the body language. So the way we think about stuff is heavily influenced by what skill sets we have. And so we should do the same for our agents as well. Okay? We should ask the agent to, based on what functions it, have, it has, choose the next step to do, the next subpass to do based on that function. So moving back to the Taylor Swift concert, the kids, okay, if you have the web search tool or you have the bank app tool, right, then you won't think about other stuff like who is Taylor Swift and blah, blah, blah. You know, you will just straight away focus on the task itself. So this helps it to focus, all right? So next up, is it going to be a little complicated now? Next up, okay, remember just now we have like, this is the web search tool. Maybe this is one subtask. Okay, what if the step is a bit too complicated, right? Like, you know, just one function itself might be a bit too much to handle. Then this is where Inception comes in, okay? If you haven't watched the movie, Inception is a dream within a dream within a dream and so on. Um, Here we have agents within an agent within an agent. Uh, so if your main agent, which I call the meta agent, it's, uh, it's not able to handle the task. And this task is still very complicated. Like, for example, use... Uh, use uh, XXX bank to pay for tickets. So this one, maybe you, you might require some authentication, need to use two-factor authentication and so on. You might want to automate this whole thing. It's not easy to automate in one function itself. How? Okay, so maybe we have a 2FA authenticator agent for banking, yeah. So we have this inner agent here that does a very complex task. That, to be honest, I don't know how this is done automatically, but I'm just giving you an example. If we want to buy the Taylor Swift concert tickets, we kind of need to have something to manage our online page purchases, right? So maybe you just relocate this subtask down to an inner agent here, to an agent that can do this more compl complicated task. And the instruction you give this inner agent. Okay, so this is a, a quick theoretical question I want to ask you. All. Like, do you think that we need to give the full details of how to do the task to this agent, like be very specific. Okay, what, what's my 2FA uh, binding site and so on? Like, do you think this is required information for the inner agent? I just want to know your feedback. Like how much information should we tell the inner agent? Or rather how much information does the meta agent need to know? How much of what the, the inner agent does? Um, how much of what the inner agent um, is doing is required knowledge for the meta agent. Yeah, only the relevant one. Yeah, so Brian said only the relevant ones. Uh, so yes, so this is um, the idea that I have. Uh, in my previous videos have been mentioning it. So it's called the multiple abstraction spaces. So in this case, this is hierarchical. Like each level only needs to know 
its level of abstractions. So the meta agent here, I right, want to buy the Taylor Swift tickets, right? You don't need to know how the 2FA works. You just need to know, like, I just need to know I need to go buy using an online banking tool. All right, how the online banking tool works, do I need to know? Does the does the meta agent need to know? Not really, right? Probably not. Yeah. No. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Yeah, so this is something that I think is very key right now, and I don't think any agentic framework does this. You don't have to let the main agent know everything. <laughs> you, don't, you can just delegate your tasks, even a very, very complex task, as a very vague instruction. And this might already allow the inner agent here to execute the thing because inner agent will have more details. Like over here, you can prompt differently. Like over here, the context, you have some context in each agent and each context is different. Like the context for the inner agent here might be more of like the details of how to use the 2FA banking and so on. The context for the meta agent will be like, oh, uh, you are a concert buyer, a concert ticket buyer. You will go to the website. You will go and find the button to buy and then you will buy two tickets, something like that. Yeah. So. Uh, maybe in there you also have like oh buy the cheapest ticket and then you have my planner you have, you have my calendar so schedule the day you know something like that 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 could be the context for the meta agent imagine this you don't have this inner agent then all the knowledge about the 2fa needs to be there in the meta agent as well okay and um that's too much context you see like large language models the more context you give them the worse they perform all right because if you give it too much knowledge Okay, it's not able to handle so much. <laughs> I mean, you can try it. Yeah, I mean, even the most state-of-the-art models at GPT-4, you try with four functions. It works, okay? Now you expand it to 10 functions. It works poorer, all right? If the other six functions are irrelevant, sometimes it might confuse and then use the irrelevant functions. So likewise, if your context is too long, it may not work as well as if your context is shorter. So um, this, again, is a key design philosophy of a task gen. We want to make each layer only know what is needed. Okay, we don't need to know, we don't need each layer to know everything. We just need to make it know enough so that it can delegate the task to the next layer if needed. And, and that's the key, the core insight. All right, we don't have to know everything. We just need to know enough for that level of abstraction for the meta agent and for the inner agent. Okay, so this is very key. Okay, this, this idea here of knowing what you need to know helps to make the agent more focused and more able to solve the task. Okay, this is a bit um, complex here. Any questions so far on this slide? Yeah, I, I do. Actually, I mean, I, I really like the example that you gave of the complex task, like the two-factor authentication. And this is perfect, right? So um, are you saying that like in the two-factor authentication, I can give the inner agent, the blue agent, the password and the token, right? So say for example, the, soft, uh, the software token so that the inner agent can actually, you know, log into the account and then, you know, send the money to uh, the concert, you know, ticket system. So would that be a function? So say for example, like, you know, uh, the inner, the blue inner agent, I would like it to authenticate to all of my bank accounts to purchase stuff from Costco, like, you know, BJ and Walmart. So I would define that as a function to tell what the, what does blue inner agent will do. Is that correct? Yes. So your inner agent will know the details of how to do the 2FA, the functions needed to link to your phone, maybe the functions needed to link to your bank. So all this will be given as the functions or the skill sets of the inner agent and all these functions are not going to be present in the meta agent because meta agent doesn't need to know to that level of detail. So yes, you are right there. Okay. So, so basically the function functions as like a constraint. So I can set the constraint to what this blue inner agent will do. Yeah. So I think what's missing in this diagram is this, uh, this inner agent also has its own functions here, which constrain what this inner agent can do. So each agent is not free to do anything. It's only able to do what the functions define it to do. Oh, okay. That's perfect. And that can translate into like the roles in the real world, right? It can be like a manager or supervisor, basically. Yeah, correct. So every nice, agent nice. will supervise the functions below it. You can think of it this way. And in this case, this inner agent is actually a function of the meta agent. How it's implemented is very cool. 
I did not define another class for meta agent. This inner agent is just converted to a function. It's wrapped around in a function and then the meta agent will just invoke this function. So this function will then call the inner agent to do its task. So that's how it's implemented back end in task gen. So, so basically, if I were to implement for a customer, I would have to like uh to have a, another complementary workflow to make sure that I break down the function or I get you know every human you know uh employee their responsibility, then I will simulate the the a similar flow chart into agents, right? Mm, yes. So what you will do is uh you will basically do uh kind of hierarchical planning in some sense. Like the top level, you just do very broad steps. And the bottom level, you do more and more specific steps. Yeah, so uh, I see. if your workflow, if you can do that as well, you can already have a structure for your meta agent and the inner agent. Like the more specific and more detailed stuff that's more related to the end product, the, to the end services, that will be your inner agent. Okay, great. So so basically, I, I can just take their their job functions and then translate directly into the, the, the inner agent functions. Yeah, I have to look at more your use case because right now I, I still have not really have a clear idea of how, how it's done. But uh, I, I think as, you get, as long as you get the right idea, the, the broad stuff is at the meta agent, the more specific stuff, inner agent, I, I think that's fine already. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, that's all for this. Okay, let's move on. So next, how do we know, okay, like when to end the task, right? <laughs> so inside each agent itself, okay, there's a planner. So the planner will look at what has been done. So over here, the planner will look at what has been done and then uh, what the task is. Okay, we'll formulate a list of steps too. We get that. And then we'll execute the next step. So, so it's a very, very um simple idea of getting the list of steps out and execute the next step. And um this uh trust me, this, this wasn't easy to, to do it. Uh, it took about two weeks to to come out with something performant for this. So the planner part um, can be improved further. I'm I'm quite sure. But the planner is the core to this because like how do we know what to execute next, what function to invoke, um, whether or not. Uh, to end the end, end the task. So end the task is also a function. So I let the planner decide, okay, each agent has a planner. So the meta agent has a planner. The inner agent has its own planner as well. So at each step, which task to do will be determined by the planner. And this basically means that we can decide um, just by looking at what has been done so far, whether or not the task has been fulfilled and whether we can end the thing. So all this will be done like in the same step step as you were to call a next function. Like so calling end task is the same as calling a function. It's like once the task has been done, we just call the end task function. Okay, so this is in a broad overview how how this sequential planning is done. Okay, um it's not perfect because you know LMs are well known to be not able to plan. <laughs> so in order to do planning is difficult. So it's able to do like planning if it's like quite straightforward and direct. Like for example, in order to buy like Taylor Swift tickets maybe you know you need to go to the website and you need to go and buy. I mean, that that's like, you, you can, the agent is able to do that. So as long as you have the right functions to guide its thinking, it should be able to plan it out. All right, so this one, I, I leave it to you all to try out like what's possible, what's not. Um, but I made it such that it's quite generic so that it should be able to work um, for arbitrary tasks, okay? So over here, oh, sorry, I see a, a chat here. I ran say the planner is like project manager for team. Yes, yes, in some sense, yeah, it's, it's more like to direct the team, okay, what to do next, what to do next. And each agent itself has a planner by default because whenever you generate the next subtask, okay, it's actually in this function called get next subtask. If you look into the code, this is where the planner is. Whenever you get the next subtask for each agent, you will try to decide wh what has been done, where the next task is. L later, I will give a slide uh, describing the process. Okay, that, that slide is like, months, not months, weeks of prompt engineering has resulted in that state that you see there. All right. So over here, the thing that I want to highlight is that I spent quite a few days, okay, on this trying out different ideas. Okay. Like how much knowledge should the meta agent give the inner agent? And how much knowledge should the inner agent give back to the meta agent? Because this part here 
you don't want to know everything that the inner agent does. Okay. But at the same time, you know, you need to know what's relevant for the task. Okay. So what I've uh, eventually settled on is like this. Whenever the inner agent does a task, it will have the meta agent's uh, context. Okay. The context by I mean, what context I mean is like what subtask has been completed by the meta agent. And it also has the overall task that the meta agent has. So at all times, even the inner agent itself will know this task here. Okay, so um, initially in my first framework for task gen, um, the task to the meta agent is is different. Okay, it's a, I mean now 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 it's a subtask. Yes, the inner agent only gets the subtask without knowledge of this this task itself. Okay, however, I found that that wasn't very performant because if the inner agent only has a subtask without the task. Sometimes it generates stuff that is not aligned to this. So the inner agent has access to the overall task and the subtask completer in order to align to objective. Yeah, I find that if we don't do that, um, the generation might just go haywire. So everyone's aligned to this central beacon for the task. And this will be passed down to all the subsidiary agents at the bottom as well. Okay, so this I think is very crucial because without this step of passing down the overall task down to the inner agents, you may not get very targeted generation or targeted use of functions even. So this is one thing that is done in task gen. The second thing is the return loop. How much should the inner agent return back to the meta agent? So V1 of this, I asked the inner agent to return to the meta agent directly, okay, something that is like, the V1 is that the inner agent returns only a summary of the subtask. So it takes all the actions that it, it does and then you return like a paragraph summary of the subtask to the meta agent. Um, however, I found that um, GP sub, the LM summarization or like the GPD summarization uh, tends to miss out important details. So if it summarizes sometimes, maybe if, if it's a web search agent, it might summarize until the website that it search, searches for is gone. Right? It just say, I have searched a website. So it, it, that's not enough for the meta agent to know, right? Like you need to know like exactly which site do you go for. And in order to prompt engineer it for arbitrary functions or arbitrary agents, it's very difficult because like what is important for each case is different for each, each case. Like it, it, you, can't, you can't have a generic prompt to do that. I mean, if you have a targeted use case, yes, you can. You can reject the prompt such that you only return a summary of the task in your inner agent. That would be better because like then your meta agent will not have too much information. So uh, the key thing is we try to minimize information flows that are unnecessary. That's the key thing. Okay, so um the V1, I I wanted to constrain this flow, but I know it wasn't working too well. So um what happens in the end? Okay, is that we will execute the subtasks. So all the subtasks inner agent executes will be in global subtask context. Okay, so this is quite important. It means that the meta agent will know exactly which functions the inner agent calls and so on. So you can treat it, the meta agent and the inner agent as one big agent, okay? Because the meta agent just calls the inner agent to execute a certain part of the plan. The inner agent will continue the plan from there. And then once it's done, the meta agent will take whatever the inner agent has done and move on. So in some sense, this meta agent, inner agent thing is the same as, uh, is similar to what, um, is basically similar to what the auto gen is doing in terms of like your different agents with different specialty and then they ch chime on one another. The whole conversation is global context. In this case, the subtask completed is the global context that all the agents have. Again, I will talk more about subtask completed on the next slide. So you just uh, bear me for that. Okay, um, Nurama, you ask why inner agent can understand subtasks without tasks. Ah, okay. So um, the meta agent, the planner itself, right? When the planner generates the next subtask, it will give an instruction to the inner agent. So th that instruction is the subtask for the inner agent. So like, for example, you want to buy the concert tickets. So the subtask to the 2FA is buy from bank XXX, you know, um, uh, charge bank XXX with this transaction on this website. So, so that, that will be the subtask. So 
However, you know, uh, even giving this instruction to the inner agent is problematic because sometimes LM do doesn't know what's important. So that's why I have to augment it with the entire subtask completed for the meta agent to the inner agent so that the inner agent knows like, oh, um, I'm actually at this website. So when the meta agent says charge the transaction, it means this website because that's the previous um, thing that was executed. So that's why we have a shared global subclass context so that when we pass instructions down, even if the instructions are not that detailed, the inner agent knows what to do. Yeah, um, does that answer the question, uh, Norma? No, it's okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah. If you if you need to clarify more later, maybe we can talk more about it. Uh, Kyrene, you asked, what happens if the inner agent encounters an error or problems? Ah, okay, very interesting question. So if the inner agent is not able to do the task, okay, there will be basically um it, it can feedback, okay, that the task not completed. So this part here, if let's say the task is not completed, we will feedback that the task is not completed and the meta agent would know. So maybe the meta agent would call the inner agent again, or the meta agent can move on to something else. So um there will be some form of feedback loop to tell the meta agent like, hey, something's wrong. <laughs> do, do something else. Okay. So um this is something that um at least is the core concept of how task gen works. It's a, a little complicated, but it's because we want to have multiple layers of abstraction like that to make things more performant. So this idea of hierarchical agents is quite natural in terms of like delegation of tasks, especially for tasks that are modular and don't require like other components. Okay, any other questions on this slide? Okay, I, I hope this is uh, clear. I, I Okay, I'll, I'll touch more on the subtask completed now. So what is this shared knowledge that the, the meta agent and the inner agent have? So one thing is the overall task is shared. So for example, if the task is like, go buy Taylor Swift concert tickets. Both the meta agent and the inner agent would know this, this overall task. But what else is shared? This subtask completed directly. Okay, so in this case, the example is the Italian one. So maybe I'll change the overall task here. So the overall task, if you if you look at the tutorial two on hierarchical agents in task gen, this is the overall task is to give me five Italian dishes um, with a dish name, dish, dish name, dish description, dish price, and dish, this price, uh, this ingredients. Yeah, so this is like the task that is given. And then the meta agent is given a few other agents. The few other agents are like the economist to come up with the price. And we have the creative writer, which comes up with, the, with kind of dish names and descriptions. We have the chef that comes up with the ingredients. And we have the boss to choose the dishes. Yeah, so this is the key thing to like if you look at the tutorial, um, you will see that there are many, many like this meta agent has a few inner agents um that does this. And like this economist itself has access to a function called get food prices or get dish prices that takes in a list of this list of dish names and then outputs outputs a certain pricing. So the thing is, for example, right now, okay in this shared subtask completed. Okay, maybe for the first subtask, okay, the meta agent calls the creative writer. So this actually is the output of creative writer. Okay, so we have this pasta, pizza, truffle, tiramisu, lasagna. Then now the meta agent say, okay, I need to come up with pricing. So what the meta agent would do is the meta agent would then call the next agent. So let's say this is output of economists. So the economist will come up with the pricing and how does the economist know what to come up with? It's because it's given the knowledge of the five dishes above, like the creative writer has come up with the dishes and the economist is able to use those dishes to call the function and comes up with the pricing here. So the economist after it is done with his task, it will output the output into the subtask completed dictionary. So this is a dictionary. Okay, why is this a dictionary? Later I'll explain. So this is a dictionary that stores all the previous subtasks that have been completed by any agent. Be it meta agent, inner agent is the same. 
because all of them are meant to solve the same task. So this, you can treat it as common knowledge between all the agents. So when the meta agent takes back control now, after the economist is done, the meta agent will know the global context of like what has been done for each of this inner agent. The meta agent can then choose what to do next based on the subtask completed. So after everything is done, then we'll call the end task. So Yeah, so the, the, the meta agent would be able to, to do this. Yeah, so, oops. Any questions on the subtask completed dictionary? So it's basically a way to, mm -hmm. to store the common knowledge of what all the agents have, have outputted. Uh, is, is this clear, by the way? <laughs> I don't know if I'm going a bit too in detail, but... um. If it's okay, maybe you give me a, a sign that you all understand this. Okay, great. All right, so best sense all, all good, right. all good. Mm -hmm. Because actually this is um, what took me two weeks to figure out, all right? Like how much knowledge to share. It's, it's tricky because we want to share as little knowledge as possible. But uh, the LM unfortunately is not able to capture the essences of, of stuff that well. So I had to do this method. Ideally, if you can, the inner agent should only share the bare essentials of what the meta agent needs to know. Like maybe for economists, like in order to come out with the pricing, it needs to come out with all the different ingredients and add them up. You know, that process, maybe the meta agent doesn't need to know. But in this case, if your economist has like a counting function to count all the ingredients, the meta agent would know that uh, because I decided not to filter it because uh, filtering it led to poorer performance. So the, the subtask completed, is a little convoluted now because all the functions called by the inner agent will all be there, right? Um, the only saving grace is that whatever instructions you give here, the context of your meta agent here, okay, context of inner agent is not known to meta agent. So we save some tokens here because um, when you want to do a very specific task, you don't need to give all that details to your meta agent. So, so that... Sure. So hi everyone. Yeah, just now there was a power outage, but I'm back. So um, what I wanted to share was that you kind of need to curate the amount of information that each agent has. So the inner agent tries to share as little as possible to the meta agent. So over here, we do not share everything. Um, right now we share the entire subtask completed because the LM is not able to curate well enough for the task. Okay, but ideally, if you could, for a specific use case, you should try to curate as little as possible. So like, for example, the inner agent, if let's say it's an economist, um, doesn't need to share like all the prices of the ingredients that have been used to make the dish, maybe. Um, we just need to share the final prices if that's relevant for the meta agent. Okay. So um, share only what's relevant is the key takeaway. So share only what is relevant. Okay, so this applies also for function outputs. Okay, so um, if you have... Later, I'll share with you what are the kind of functions you can interface with your agent if you are doing external functions, okay? Or, I mean, even the large language model functions. Uh, you don't have to share everything to your meta agent. Okay, so think about it. Like, if imagine you are like a worker and then you have your boss. Uh, you don't have to share all the details of what you did to your boss, right? Like, I mean, unless your boss really wants to know everything. Uh, if not, you just need to share what's relevant for your boss needs. Like, if your boss is thinking about like, um, what is the structure of the um of the product? Then you just need to share the, the the structural details. You don't have to share like oh what what are the kind of things that I did over the weekend and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's not relevant. Yeah. So this is a very key concept that I would like to ingrain here. So if you are using the task gen framework, try as best as possible to only give the top level agents like the meta agent only what they need to know. So like let's say the meta agent or the agent calls a function and the function returns back something, ensure that what the function returns back is what the agent needs to know. Because if you give too much information, for example, if you use Langchain, okay? <laughs> if you give all the information back, including the thoughts, actions, observations, and so on, uh, if you give all this back, it's going to flood the context and it's not going to do well. So um, that leads to my next point, all right? So we have the React framework, right? If you all know about the React framework, reasoning and acting framework. 
Yeah. So basically, this framework is better known as as um this thoughts, uh, action, or observation, thoughts than action. So you, like you helps to choose like a certain action to do. Um. So there's a, there's an issue that I realized with the React framework. Okay. To the boss. Okay. At every step. You have a lot of information not required. So it would be better if like the React framework, although at every level you need to do observation, thoughts, and actions, you know, when you actually store it, like maybe you could store only the, the decision. Yeah. So maybe that's enough already to as you move on. Because every at every step, you will have a new observation. Yeah. Maybe you can also store like an overall plan. Yeah, so that's that's all you need to store. You don't have to store all the observations and thoughts and everything. That will flood, that will flood the amount of context that you need for the next turn. Um, same thing for conversation. If you are doing conversational bots, right now we store too much. We store too much information. Okay, you don't need to know every single thing of that conversation. You just need to store what's needed for that task. And task gen, okay, the key concept of task gen, store only what's necessary. Okay, you don't store any more, any less. Okay, you store only what's necessary. And like if the large language model is not able to help with, with doing the storing, all right, that's why like the subtask completed. Unfortunately, I have to give all the inner agent functions as well because for generic use cases, uh, I, I, I want task gen to be generic and not just for any domain. Uh, for any generic use case, it's not possible for the large language model, large language model to curate things that well. So I, I put all the outputs here. But if you have functions that you 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 input to task gen, please make the output as concise as possible that is relevant for the task, okay, as best as possible, so that you avoid flooding of context. So the key thing here is minimize what you need to give in the context. Okay. Questions for this so far? I think this is a very important slide and also a key issue that I see in many agentic frameworks. Okay, it's about the information sharing part. All good. Right. So, so uh, one one question here is that uh, what about if you have two inner agents, and then you have some dependencies in terms of the task to be done? Say, say for example, um, you know, I have a robot, and the robot needs to make sure that I have meat before I can cook lasagna, right? So, uh, so the kitchen manager have to verify that uh, you know we have meat, and then the cook uh, agent, uh, you know, will then cook. Right. So how, how would we handle that dependency um, in this case? Okay, so uh, you mean after you cook, the, the ingredients will be gone, right? Like, they'll be used Correct. up? Correct, right, right, right. And the next day, you wouldn't have meat uh, anymore. So you want to make sure that you have meat. So the, the kitchen manager needs to go and check to have meat. And then before, you know, to accept the order from the waiter, right? Mm. Okay, so in this, actually, um, this is the... The part of task gen that I have, I have yet to implement, but I'm intending to implement is called um global global state. So basically, like I intend to give some variables whereby, where everyone can see, like, or basically everyone means all agents are all agents can see. So when any agent updates the global state immediately, the context will be updated for all the inner agents as well. Yeah, so this will store like the stuff for like ingredients and so on. You can define what global state you want. Uh, right now it's not there yet. It will be there soon. Okay, because I I intend to code it out soon. So I think this is important because right now the task gen framework, we assume that um no global state is needed. Like if there's any global state, it will be in shared variables, which is unknown to the meta agent. Okay, shared variables is only known like it's basically just a place to store your variables to pass to all the functions. But if you want the meta agent or the inner agent to know something and use it for planning, we need to put it in the prompt. Okay, so right now, um, there's no way to do this yet. But once the global state is introduced, maybe in the next version of task gen, uh, you should be able to put whatever things like ingredients or dishes cook, or this will be in the global state so that the agents can use it for planning. Oh, okay. Oh. That's perfect. And also, uh, how, how many meta agents are you allowed to have? Like, say, for example, I have a company and a company I have, like, you know, five VPs. And I want those five VPs, you know, all to be like, you know, meta agent. 
Is that possible on this ver uh, version? Um, actually, we only interact with one agent uh, when we assign the pass. So um, if let's say you want to have five VPs, then maybe the five VPs will be under one meta agent. The five VPs, each VP can be an inner agent and all this will be under a meta agent, which is like uh, the main agent to complete your task. Yeah, so oh, you okay. only talk okay. to one agent and the agent is the meta agent. Okay, perfect. That works, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, but don't worry, the inner agent and meta agent actually no difference. The only difference is that the inner agent is, is underneath an agent. But the structure of the inner agent here, honestly, is the same as the structure of the meta agent. There's no difference. Yeah. So <laughs> um, in terms of the code wise, the agent blocks are the same. Okay, let's move on. So um, that's more or less the key concept of past gen. I think this is very important because uh, I believe this is where it differs a lot from the other agentic frameworks because other agentic frameworks are more conversational based. Uh, they don't really curate the information as much as what I try to do over here in task gen. But I think this curation and filtering of information, uh, letting only those that need to know, know the stuff, will help a lot with the accuracy of the outputs for agents. All right, so these are the design philosophies, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, be as concise as possible, the instructions for minimal token use. When we call the agents from the top to the bottom, we want to make sure there's no cycles. Uh, we don't want to be like auto GPD that keeps doing the same task again and again. So it only goes down to the final function of the inner agent and then back up again. All right, we won't keep from the inner agent call back the top agent. So auto gen also has this problem. All right, auto gen allows uh, calling of any agent inside the function loop. Okay, so. I think that's uh, to be avoided. Okay, we, we shouldn't do this. Okay, if we do this, we might end up with an infinite loop. So we, we try not to do that. Okay, we try to follow the structure of the hierarchy. And then, so the hierarchy can treat it like filtering. So like at the first level of the extraction, you filter to the right agent to use or right function to use. If you filter to an agent, the next agent will then decide which function to use and so on. So it's a, it's a hierarchical thing so that we can find the best function that can fit that subtask. All right. Uh, inner agents have the same structure as meta agent because we want all of them to be agents. <laughs> we want all of them to have functions. Each level of agents only get what's required for that level. Like the Taylor Swift agent at the top, you don't need to know how the 2FA works. The 2FA agent at the bottom, uh, then you put all the details there. Okay, so that's how we should design the agents. Right? And uh, we do a plan by a limited amount of planning. Okay, we basically generate a list of steps to do that plan. And then we check whether the plan has been fulfilled. Each step of the plan has been told to map to exactly only one function, okay, so that we constrain the output, very important. And I also implemented a rule-based check to make sure that we exit the loop once the plan is complete. Because trust me, even if the plan is complete, GPT can say plan completed, but the next function they call is another function that is not the end task. So that happens, okay? Don't ask me why this happens. Okay, it's because of stochastic nature of large language models. Uh, sometimes, even if it knows that the task has been completed, it wants to do something more to refine the output, and it doesn't call the end task. So that's very frustrating. Okay, that's why I have to do a, a rule based check. Okay, V one doesn't have any rule based check for this, but the current version. Okay, actually the current version is called V one. Okay, so maybe I call I call the first version V zero. Okay, so in the final version, which is now the V one. Rule-based checks are used in order to exit the planning loop so that when the task is complete, we can just exit it. So I will be going through a bit of some code in terms of how to do it, uh, but I won't be going in detail because today's session is not meant to be a coding session. It's meant to be a more conceptual, philosophical like design session. And I also like to encourage uh, you all to contribute your views as well because I want task gen to be more of a community thing. It's not just like my thing. Just, uh, I don't like current agentic frameworks. I, I really wish we can do something better. So task gen is my initial efforts to try to make something better. Uh, if you can think of something that is better than like, or enhances what, what is there right now, let me know as well. Yeah, you can feel free to contribute. So like Brian here has helped to contribute some stuff on Rack already. Like, so I think this is something that um, together, if you have like your use cases and stuff like that, that you think certain features can be enhanced. You can either let me know, I have to code it out, or you can try to code it out and then we can contribute this together. Okay, so, but in terms of basic code, how do we use task gen 
Okay, actually quite simple. I mean, before that, you have to do a few things like uh, you have to do pip install taskgen-ai okay, because taskgen has been taken up, so I have to use taskgen-ai. Um, then after that, you can just from taskgen import star. Okay, import everything. Okay, that's all you need to do. Okay, within taskgen itself, you also, you also have the strict JSON functions. Okay, you have um, you also have this function which can can uh, make an LM based function or external function. Now explain, and then you have agent. So actually, that's more or less what you need to know for task gen. That's the three main things you need to know. So let's talk about agent first. So what do you do with agents? Okay, you just put your agent name and your agent description. All this will go into the prompt for the agent. So you can specify how the agent behaves inside your description. All right, and the name here is just to help, you know, if your agent is used as a function, then this function name will be helpful for the meta agent to match to the right agent to use. So uh, please try to be as, this, as informative as possible in your agent name. Don't just name it agent one, agent two. Try to name it what it's doing, right? Like. Uh, if it's doing 2FA authentication, the agent name will be a 2FA authenticator. All right, it helps the semantic mapping when we do like LM based selection. In each agent, I made it such that, you know, you can just step through the agent one by one with, uh, with the task and so on. Uh, so there's this main thing called status. You can see what is your agent status right now. You can see the name is helpful assistant. Description is generalist agent. The functions available. Okay, you can use the LM to perform a task. This is by default is there, and you have the end task. Okay, you can also remove the use LM if you if you don't want it. Yeah, so if you want purely just functions without the large language model to reply, okay, then remove the use LM. You can just use uh, my agent dot remove function, and then you can just put use. You, you can just do like that, and then this will remove the LM function. Okay, you can also remove the end task, but if you do that, your agent will never end. <laughs> so, so we'll try not to remove the end task. Okay. Um, so this is um this is one thing here. Um the task, which is what task we assign to the agent. What are the subtasks completed, which is that dictionary that we saw earlier, the with, with uh, the subtask name as well as the subtask output. And then we have like whether the task is completed or not. So let's uh okay, any questions for this so far? All right. Um Let's move on. How do you run the task? So for example, if you have a task like this, um, give me five words rhyming with who, and then make a four sentence poem using them. So this is your task. You just need to put my agent dot run and then you will run the task um, with a total of like max subtasks is by default is five. So it's like max five steps. Okay, but if your five steps are out, you can just run again, okay? You can just keep running, all right? Um, it will just continue from the previous state. Unless you do this thing called my agent dot reset, they will reset subtask completed, task assigned, yeah, and task completed status. Yeah, so if you don't do uh my agent dot reset, you can just keep running and running and running. It will just build on whatever things that you have done before. So you can treat this like a way of doing like, I think like more like PyTorch, or uh, where you can just continue your state like. It's meant to be very modular, so you can just control your agent directly. So you don't have to go through very complicated, like agentic loops that you can't control. I want you to be able to control it. So you have all these functions like reset, run. So so you you, you first initialize your agent, you can just keep running to do the task. All right. So like for example, in this task, the planner agent was split up into two subtasks. Find five words from your pool, create a four sentence poem using them. So you can see this part here goes into subtask history. And then you see next subtask identified, create a four sentence poem using the rhyming words. And you see, this is why we need subtask history. Uh, if we don't have the subtask history for the second subtask, then GPT will say, I do not have the rhyming words. Please give me the rhyming words. Okay. Because you see the subtask is not specific. Yeah, I tried to make GPT make it specific. It doesn't work that well. So using this subtask history as the context works great. Okay. So this after two, three weeks of prompt engineering, this is the result. Right. So I'm just telling you where are some of the pain points and some of the points that GPT couldn't do so that you know as well. So, I mean, I'm just sharing some of my insights when I spent three weeks doing this. All right. So um, once you have all this output here, okay, you can use this to create a four sentence poem. You see over here, this is the poem. Um, this is not four sentences. Um, this is by no means a failure of the agent. Okay, this is just the large language model. Uh, it's not that great at generating uh, the sentence to follow the number of words or the number of sentences. Okay, so if um, you want to make this even better, what you can do is you can create a 
a function to this agent that does like reflection or or you can in your in your task itself you can add in some more you can add in more like reflect and ensure exactly yeah you can you can you, you can do that here so the agent would know that okay it needs to make sure that it works yeah so this all can be done with prompting questions on this this is basically how the agent splits into subtasks okay so next we go into agent reply. So there's this thing called reply user. Reply user typically takes in nothing. Basically, it just replies the user based on what the, the task asks for. So like the task asks for a four-sentence poem with the five words, right? So it just replies the user what the user needs to know. Okay, you can also ask um, for other things like my agent.reply user. You can ask like, where is the pool? Okay, and then the answer for this can be like, by it is the pool is in the school. So this can function like a question answer bot. Once the agent has come up with certain subtasks completed that history there, you can ask my agent.reply user and then you can put whatever query you want over here. And this can like query the state of the agent and give you a relevant response based on what is in the state, uh, what, what is in the subtask completed. So again, you can see the status after you've run the task. Uh, you can see that the task has been updated here. And the subtask completed, we have everything here, including the query to the user. So the query to the user is also a subtask here. All right. If you don't want this to appear, you can always put at, as the input state pool equals to false. Then it won't be um, inside the subtask history. But the reply to the user is in the subtask history as well, so that we can take advantage of what the user asks as the subtask. So if you want to do this as like a virtual assistant or so on. Like if the user queries the agent and so on, whatever the user query will be stored in subtask history, you can use it as context. So the next time the user says, hey, I bought a wrong thing, like you, I should buy this instead. Then the agent will know, okay, the, the user is referring to something else. So I store this in the subtask history so you can use it for like virtual assistant purposes as well. So for reply user. And in the end, you can see that is task completed? This is true because we have completed all the subtasks. The, the planner returns, yes, we have done it. All clear on this? This is the main um, agent loop. Hey, John. Um, I was I was thinking to like you know, say for example, in this case, to pull these five words, you know, from a file, and then output it, you know, back to a file. Um, so I don't know if you want to cover this, or you know, maybe like a follow up workshop or something. Yeah, I can do a more detailed um session on how to use shared variables and history because uh and memory because. What you're talking about is the shared variables bit. Like, how do you pull information that is not from the large language model and store information not going back to subtask completed? We allow for that in task gen as well. Yeah, but that's a bit more advanced. So I, I don't think I'll be covering that much in detail for today. Okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you're interested, we can definitely do another session to cover the more advanced features. Like, there's a lot of features I've included. Um, this is actually the biggest project I've coded in my entire life. Um, and I, I'm looking forward to, to improve on it. Yeah, so this is something that I'm very passionate about, as you can see. And yeah, I definitely will, will I don't mind doing another session to, to do the more in-depth ones. Okay, but sure, right now, sure. let's, do the, let's do the first part, all right? Let's do the basics. Okay, so next we have functions. Okay, so um, if I may request, um, maybe we stay another 15 minutes because I still have about 15 minutes worth of content to cover. So uh, for agent functions, Okay, what we do for the functions is like this, okay? We have two kinds of functions. One is an internal function. Uh, what is an internal function? An internal function is a function that basically uses the large language model to generate the output for you. So imagine this. You don't even need to write your function. You just need to say what the function is doing and the LLM will be your function. So like this, I'll put a sentence with object and entity in the style of emotion. You can see all this in angle brackets is the order of your function in input variables. So for example, this function will be called, um, the, the function name will be like over here, you, you didn't give a function name variable. So the function name will be auto-generated by strict JSON um, to match the description. So over here, let, let's just call it like sentence style. Okay, let's say the sentence name is called sentence style. So this will basically define this and then return output. 
So over here at the in the middle here, LM will do the function, and then you will, you will return the output. So the LM based internal function is very powerful. Okay, now no longer you, do you need to code out the exact function. You just need to say what your function does, and the LM will do it for you, right? So this object entity in motion must be in the same order as what you define in your description. And there's a reason, okay, why I did this, why I did the variables inside the description itself. Okay, typical a, a function calling, what they do is like that. Output a sentence with, a, with object and entity in style of emotion. And then what will happen is they take as inputs maybe like var1, var2, var3. Like, so there will be a like separate input field for all this. Uh, the problem with this kind of thing, like what they do in function calling, is that this thing here, and you know, matching with the function description here, uh, sometimes it may not match because your variable names may not know, uh, may, may not be very indicative of what exactly the function description is doing. So GPT will have problems doing the matching. But if you put in angle brackets your function name over here, uh, function variables here, it's very accurate. Okay, so this can improve on function calling. Yeah, I've tried both methods. This method works better. So this is a, a secret trick that I'm using. Yeah, not really secret because I'm, I'm open sourcing this. This is a trick that I realized works. Okay, so if you put the variable name directly inside the function description, it works better for the LM to, to know how to call this function. Okay, and that's why we are using this in task gen or straight JSON. Okay, so you can see this is actually <laughs> very, very similar to uh, the straight JSON. Like, this function description, honestly, this is actually the system prompt for straight JSON. All right. In backend, if you see the function, we actually pass this to system prompt. And then what the user inputs to the function will be given as user prompt. All right. And the output format is the same as the straight JSON output format. So this is an internal function. How is done? External functions, okay, is where the key crux of task gen is because you know, most times you want to in, uh, interface it with like web browsing agents, you want to interface it with, sorry, web browsing tools, maybe 2FA authentical, uh, authenticator tools, you want to infuse it with like knowledge graph retrieval tools and so on. All this are done in external functions. And how do we define external functions? We define it like that. We have a function description again. And over here, you can put in your, your description of like how the variable is. So if you want type checking to be done, you can even put in something like that. X is an integer or X is a string. So whatever type checks that work for string JSON, you can put in as well in the angle brackets. So uh, yeah, so that's how, how it will look like. Okay, and uh, yeah, basically we'll ensure that the type is matched for the function calling. All right, so this already all done in task gen. All right, so this output format here um, is basically to describe to the large language model how the output will look like. Okay, later I'll show you how the function input and output will look like to the, to the agents, okay? So the external function we can call here binary to decimal. Okay, um, the function's name will be the name of this external function. Okay, unless you define another variable called function name here that you can override the name. Yeah. So um, this is a more advanced feature. Um, this basically um, uses this doc string here to convert it into like that. So it will take in the, the input types, okay, and the, the names of the, the variables as over here as your function description. So you don't have to define your function description inside function anymore. You can just put in the doc string for your external function. As long as it contains all the compulsory variables, this will pass. Okay, if not, we'll return an error to you. So this uh, makes things easier for developers. Okay, as long as you have your doc string here that matches with the compulsory variables, we will do the function description conversion for you automatically. Okay, all you need to do now is to write a very informative um, key over here. All right, and description so that the, the planner would know like what this function is outputting. Okay, so this is something that uh, I think is missing in function calling because you don't have a description of what the function is returning. The LM is not able to know like what exactly the function does. So this output format is also quite important. Any questions so far for this? Um, this is one of the key things for task gen. Okay, so now I move on to how this is interpreted by the agent. So now we have an agent here. We define the agent as before. Now we assign the functions. Okay, and this is basically your binary to decimal function earlier and the sentence style function earlier. And you can see these are the list of functions that the, the agent will see. 
So if you look at OpenAI function calling, it's like that. If you look at the function representation in TaskGen, it's like that. Can you see the difference? <laughs> so it's just like the name, the description. Okay, what are the input variables used and what are the outputs? So um, this is used so that, you know, we can force the LM, okay? Firstly, the name and description is used for matching to see what function to call. The input here is to ensure that, you know, the LM knows like, okay, these are the inputs that are, are absolutely compulsory that you need to know. Okay, and all these are um, extracted using regex from the angle brackets. So these are done automatically. And the output here is basically what the LM will be outputted. So use LM is like that. Uh, it's an internal function that we will call the LM to answer your question. All right, end task is when task is completed. Binary to decimal is to convert some input number to, to a base 10. All right, and the input is X. Generate sentence with emotion is the same thing. Generate a sentence with object and the T style of emotion. Takes in object and the T emotion. Outputs a sentence. So this is what is given to the large language model. You can see that it can scale pretty well. I think you give it 20 functions, it will still fit in context. All right, so that's the beauty of the, the way it's structured in TaskGen. So how do we run the functions? After we assign the agent the functions, we just like say, oh, generate me a happy sentence with a number, convert this 1001 to decimal, and a ball. So what, what happens like that? First, it finds out, okay, I need to convert the number to decimal. So I get output nine. Then it says, oh, I need to get a happy sentence with the number and a ball. So you can see the converted number, it will take from subtask completed. It will know this is a nine. And then it will call the, the parameters correctly. Number nine, ball, happiness. It will call this function generate sentence with emotion, okay? Which is the automatic generated name for that sentence style function earlier. So you can see this, the output, the LM output like that. So very cool, right? I didn't even define this function. I, I didn't even code this function out. I just simply say that the function takes in this tree and output something, and the LM does it for me. This is an LM-based function. Very powerful. I, I, I like LM-based functions a lot. Okay, so you can see task completed successfully. We can reply the user. The answer is the number nine brings me so much happiness, just like a ball does. Okay, so really cool. I encourage you all to try out the notebooks. Uh, put in your own functions. Okay, just go crazy, put in your functions, uh, try to run your task and see whether it works. Yeah, I'm very excited to see whether this works for you. Okay, so um, let's suppose you want to find out how to find, like what function to call next. Okay, instead of doing the dot run method, which basically just does all the subtasks for you one by one, you can actually manually step through the functions to call also. Like what you can do is, um, like firstly, I reset the state here. Okay, so the uh, agent starts at the blank state. I basically give it the task that I want to do. And then the first function that the planner decides that it needs to be done, okay, you can output the function name and the function params. Over here, you can see the function name is generate sentence with emotion. And the function params is this object is bell, entity is dog, emotion is happy. So just to let you know, this adheres to typing of function inputs is defined in function description. So if let's say your function description is something like like x is an integer, or like over here, if let's say your object is a string, we will make sure the object is a string. Okay, so this this has some typing already inbuilt in the um in task gen. So what you can do over here, you can just take your task over here and you can match to your next function you need to call. And then in order to use the function, it's very simple. You just need to say use function. And you know, if you want this to go inside your subtask history, you can put stateful equals to true. Otherwise, stateful equals false means you can just run the function, but it won't affect the agent state. So that's how it works. Yeah. Any questions for this? Okay, so I think uh, we are more or less reaching the end for the presentation today. So uh, under the hood, this is like how the planner does. So this took like two weeks of iterations before this, this is the final one. I mean, of course, um, if you have something better, you can you can suggest to me that we can we can see whether it's better. So like thoughts, we ask the LM to think about how to do the task, then categorize them or structure them into an array of steps. You okay, note the word array, right? So that um, it generates the list out better, right? Then after that, we'll, we ask you to reflect, okay, what is still left to do? Okay, so this overall plan is everything that needs to be done. The reflection is like, hmm, what has been done and what's still left to do, all right? And then based on the reflection, we will then say, okay, which elements if the overall plans have been completed? So let's say if the overall plan is like search web for Taylor Swift. 
concert tickets website and then like buy tickets. So if let's say you, you already have searched for the website, your, your plan over here would be true false because like you have only done the, so maybe your, your reflection here is like um, concert ticket website, found tickets not bought. Yeah, so this could be the reflection. Yeah. Then the next step of the overall plan would be buy tickets. Okay, and then we will choose the function to call. So maybe we'll call the 2FA authenticator here. And then if let's say the function takes in a word instruction, we can put the word instruction, if not an A. Okay, uh, what will happen is later there will be another loop that takes in this function, 2FA authenticator, and mm -hmm. forces the output parameters to be of the certain style and certain uh, type that is defined in your function description. So over here, you can see all the prompt engineering stuff is here, chain of thought, reflection, using list-based planning to, um, to adhere to some structure, constraint generation by mapping to a function. And then at the end here, uh, I will just check whether the overall plan completed, if it's all true, okay? If overall plan completed is all true, if all elements in overall plan com completed, are true, then n plus. Yeah. So this is the rule based override that I did because sometimes the LM just keeps generating new tasks. Questions for this slide? This is a very important slide, actually. All good? Okay, so um, these are advanced features I just briefly mentioned here. So if you are interested, I will do another session to touch on this. This can take another one and a half hours just to cover all this. So uh, in order to like ensure that we can do like non-text modalities, like you can have shared variables, we can even store like file names and so on that you can access, like images, videos, and so on. Lengthy text you can store in another variable that you can access that is independent of the planner. Like the planner doesn't need to know all this. You can just retrieve from this shared variable to do your processing and then output back to the shared variables pool. Okay, you don't have to let the subtask completed know about it. Okay, so it's like doing things on the side. Okay, but these things on the side are useful for the task. It's just that to the planner, you just need to tell the planner, I've done the task. The planner doesn't need to know, oh, I've transcribed this one million token sentence into something else, and the output is this one million tokens. The planner doesn't need to know that. The planner just needs to know transcription complete. All right, so you can think of like an operating system. So um, shared variables enable the LM to perform like an operating system. It calls various tools. Like if it's a, if let's say it's a mobile phone operator, like to operate a mobile phone, then the the, the functions could be, go to web page, click button, um, buy tickets. So you don't have to let the LM know. Oh, this is how I bought the tickets. You can just let the LM know tickets have been bought. That's all. That's all the planner needs to know. So shared variables enable you to do this. Uh, Brian asks, uh, can I return task failed with it too then? Yes, you can return task failed and you can also return how to solve the task failure, like split into smaller subtasks or call something else instead. So you, you if you have external functions here, you can actually uh, program your external functions to return an error if not completed. Okay, So if let's say you are using an agent here, um, the, the failure will be auto replied. Okay. But if you are using your functions, um, you actually can program your external functions to return like an error and like how, how to rectify. So not just an error, maybe like how to rectify. This is very important. Okay. Then your planner can use the how to rectify to do the next part of the plan. All right. So it's meant to be very versatile. So feel free to use this chat variables. Uh, memory, memory, I think will form the key bulk of the advancements of task gen. Uh, so like first up, the most basic is how to use rec to select your functions. Like let's say you have hundred functions, you can rec over the function description and names and and map it to the task to see the cosine similarity and so on. Or you can do your own advanced mapping. I'll cover on how you can implement your own advanced mapping next time. Okay. So this one you can select the right function needed for your task, and in the context of the agent only like the top k in the, by default top k is like five. So the top five functions would be given. All right. So this one, if you are interested, this is in the mem memory bank variable of agent. You can check out tutorial four on memory if you are interested for more on, on this. So like this shared variables, you can check out tutorial three. 
on shared variables. So uh, other than the function-based rank, there's also additional information you can put inside the input prompt. Um, maybe additional instructions or like past expert knowledge. You can put that in your memory as well. And the right knowledge is something like a rack over documents. Right? You can put in those stuff as part of the context if you put those in memory bank as well. So um, details for this, I will cover in another session, okay? Because I think there's a lot to cover for this. Okay, uh, before I like go to the questions, uh, any any burning questions you want to ask before we go into discussion for today? All right, sounds good. So, oh uh, yeah, before I go into the discussion, um, just help spread the word for TaskGen, okay? It's free to use even commercially, all right? I want to make this as open as possible because I really don't like existing agentic structures. I want to move to something better. So TaskGen is my first effort to help us to go there, help to like and start the GitHub if possible. All right, and um, this is also quite, quite important, all right? If you have your own use case, you created your own external functions, like web browsing functions, or you created like, I, I don't know, other functions to process images and so on, feel free to contribute them. It will be inside this contrib folder. Right, I, I didn't specify much of this because I leave it open for your use case. But if you have this, you want to share to the world, please uh, commit to the GitHub. Okay, I'll, I'll just add it in. Uh, if you have Jupyter Notebooks to illustrate some of the agentic structures you are creating, if you are willing to share, please uh, please feel free to share as well. All right. So best thing you ask, when's the next session? I mean, if you want to do the next session on memory, I can do it next week. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, Kyrian said definitely would like to have case study workshop session. Yeah, definitely. Let's discuss more on our Discord group. All right. So uh let's move to the last five minutes. Um, again, apologies for, for for running over. So the questions I have to ask is this, okay? The planner agent okay might sometimes generate a similar next step as before. Okay, like you no know, LMs being LMs, they might redo the same task again. Okay, how can we mitigate that? Okay, so actually, to answer that, there's actually a rule-based mechanism that um, if uh, if next step is already in subtask completed, then end. All right. So this again is uh, it's not a very elegant fix. Okay, um, it's something that LMs went better. This you don't have to do this. Okay, there's a problem with this is that um, if it is OS style instructions, sometimes you need to do the same instruction again. Okay, like for example, open web page, open web page. Yeah, so um, I haven't really found a good fix to this yet. Yeah, so I think one way to do this is every time you want to, like if you're doing OS-based instructions, reset agent before every instruction. Yeah, so, so this is like, the best fix I can think of so far. But right now, because of the way the, um, it, I don't want the next step to keep looping forever, I actually do a rule-based hard exit. Okay, if we want to do like the same instruction again, this is currently a limitation in past gen, still trying to figure out how to solve it. Um, One way perhaps is maybe if we have a global context, then we wouldn't need to store the past instructions anymore. We can put like, oh, I'm currently a web page X and you don't have to store like, oh, I've opened this web page, open this web page. Yeah, so this is something that um we can think about next time. All right, still open for discussion for that. All right, uh, Julio, you asked, can the agents and associated memory um be persisted and reloaded, for example, via pickle? Okay, currently no, but since uh, you have requested this feature, I don't mind coding it in. It's actually quite simple to do it. So we can uh we can basically load agent and then it will be stored in a pickle file. And then you can make maybe, so it's save agent will go to the pickle file and then load agent will load back the pickle file to the agent. That can be done. Yeah, uh, easily done actually. Yeah, so I, I can do this for you for the next task gen. So best thing you ask, um, my questions are mostly in the field of memory. One open question I would like to get your take on to think over the week is how do you see embeddings of nodes and should relationships be embedded as well? Okay, so this one, are you talking about knowledge graph? <laughs> so we got notes and yeah, okay. So um I think this one is dependent on how you want to retrieve the knowledge graph. Like where are your important points? Like 
some people store the important points in notes, some store in ages, some store in both. So usually what we do for knowledge graph, we take triplets of the note, each note, and then we convert them to text to the to fit the context for the last language model. So yeah, it really depends on how you define your knowledge graph. You are basically just extract, you can just treat your knowledge graph as a list of documents. You are just extracting the relevant documents to, to use. Yeah, so if your index is better in the note, you use your you use your note as index. If your index is better in the age, you use the age as index. Yeah. So no real answer to your question. It really depends on how you define the knowledge graph. Yeah. Uh, Julia, you ask again. I can read and write myself. Just want to make sure that there were not any issues that you can think of. Yeah. No, I don't think there's any issues because the subtask comp. If you want to pickle your agents, okay. If you want to because what you need to store is you need to store. Agent name, description, um, task assigned, um, subtask completed, maybe uh, global variables if, if, if we still have global variables. Like, um, I haven't implemented global variables yet, but there will be global, then there's chat variables also. So, all these can be, uh, all these are picklable. Uh, picklable. Yeah. You can actually store them into one, one pickle and then you can look back again. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, basically it. I mean, you can you can just currently right now just take all the variables yourself by like agent, my agent dot subtask completed. You can actually take all the states of all this yourself by referencing the right variables. Um, but since you requested the feature, I can just put it in officially in Tasgen. Uh, it won't take too much time. All right. Right, Sebastian, you asked, uh, I guess it's all implementation specific, but in a more general sense, what is taught in embeddings of nodes that isn't in traditional representations of nodes? What is taught in embeddings that is... Yeah, so embeddings are more generic than, than the node itself. Like embeddings are like in, a, in an abstracted space already. So um, it may or may not store everything. So if you look at my previous YouTube video on contextual and context-dependent embeddings, like I have an idea of how to make embeddings a bit more versatile by doing different contexts to it. So uh, I mean, embeddings is a nice thing. Embeddings are a nice thing. It's just that sometimes they abstract away too much and you lose the the, the specific information that you need. Like uh, your text embedding might lose the person that you're referring to because that, that gets embedded away. Uh, an image, if you embed the image using clip, okay, you might embed away the positions of where the dog is in the picture, where the table is in the picture. So like, if you remember one of the sessions I did earlier, it's called app, app agent. App agent it loses uh, information of the positions of the UI boxes. So they actually use the XML to supplement it. So embeddings loses specific information. We need to have different modes of, uh, if, so I, I like to call this multiple abstraction spaces. I, I believe we, like for example, image domain, we cannot just have only one picture, all right? We need to have the picture interpreted and maybe objects, pixel level, other like background. Like basically there are different ways to view it. And then you, you take collectively all these ways to solve the problem. All right. So yeah, I think we can talk more about that maybe the next session when we talk more about shared variables and memory. Yeah, we can do one more next week. All right. Next, how can we integrate various forms of memory into an agent? Um, I think this is the same thing for multiple abstraction spaces. Like the key idea is each agent should only know at their level of abstraction. So like the top level agent should know very broad stuff, the bottom level agent more specific stuff. Yeah, that's that's my key idea of how the memory is. And you have different memory that can match different abstraction spaces. Like for example, if you are doing image processing, maybe some memory could be about images uh, in general. The pixel, uh, some memories could be about the objects that you will see. Maybe some memories could be about the actions that you would see in the image. So multiple abstraction spaces help to make your agent or make your, your function more robust because you are able to cater it for all different kinds of combinations of these abstraction spaces. So this is something I've been advocating quite a lot and I intend to make a working system out of this using TaskGen. Okay, so the best thing you mentioned makes sense. I'll bring a more concrete question to the table next time around. Yeah, no, no, no worries. Yeah, happy to share stuff. Okay, so um, the last question is, uh, what level of context should this agent function have access for best performance? So again, this is like no at each level of abstraction. <laughs> I mean, there's no right or wrong. The only wrong answer is that, like try to avoid is giving too much irrelevant 
info for each patient. Okay, and with that, actually, we have come to the end for the questions to ponder. Um, any other comments that you want to add to these questions or any other questions you want to say, please uh, voice them now before we end the session. Okay, Brian, you asked something. I remember you talked about multi-modality. Yeah, multi-modality is in shared variables. Like so you can use shared variables to, to do your processing for images, audio, and so on. Um, because you can't possibly pass that information back into the subtask completed. So you, you have to do this separately. So that's why the shared variables earlier was also helps to do multimodal stuff like shared variables. Let me show you shared variables. This one. Yeah. Yeah, multimodal stuff will be in the agents. That's right. Okay, not uh thanks for staying to the end. I know I overran a bit, but hopefully you found this interesting and uh do help to spread the word. Okay, I kind of want more people to test out the framework, use this for your own arbitrary projects, because I kind of want this to be better than autogen. Okay, that's the hope. And I feel like there's a lot of things that existing agentic frameworks are not good. I mean, if you look back at that slide here, you can see like what are my gripes about the existing frameworks. Like these are the things that task gen is trying to handle. And I feel that that's a lot of promise because it's already working for some of the use cases I've, I've done for Symbian and even more for my own other stuff as well. So that's, that's promise. And this is just the beginning. So with your help, and with everyone's help here, we will make it better. And yeah, that's it for today. Thanks. See ya. Thank you. Great job. Thank you.